New Year's Eve is a day of celebration where people around the world rejoice and party. In three sheets, I travel around the world and I party wherever I go. I bring the party with me, which makes me often wonder if there's a party where I'm not. Today, I have been brought to some remote destination in the middle of, uh, what do you call this place? Oh, yes, Manhattan, where I should do an international pub crawl. There we go. Woo! Put it down, go! <laughs> Join me. Every night, in every city around the world, it happens. People pour into local watering holes to, well, drink. It's my mission, that's me, to traverse the globe, getting to know these different people and their drinking customs. Bellying up to the bar, and with any luck, making some new friends. <laughs> When doing a pub crawl, international or otherwise, you must remember two things. Uh, map out your route so you know where you're going, because drunk people making decisions isn't a good idea. And bring along friends, because doing a pub crawl by yourself isn't much fun. So I've actually brought friends. I have, I have Eric, the sound guy. I got Mike Kelly, producer. Christina, who you know, she throws up a lot. And then, of course, Curtis. Curtis isn't really a friend, but he's, he has to come because we need a camera guy. Actually, we'll use you. Can we use you instead as a camera guy? Come on, let's go. All right, John, we've got a lot of drinking to do. Let's step it up. <laughs> oh, hello. Lamprey. Zane Lamprey. Manhattan, a melting pot and a watering hole. Where I've mapped out a course through nine bars representing drinking customs from around the world. I international pub crawl for a living. Now I'm offering you guys a way to do it in New York City. If you come to New York to do this pub crawl, you might actually want to go in geographic order, hopping subways and walking from bar to bar, and you might want to allow two nights. As for me, I have a driver who's gonna zigzag me across town from bar to bar as they open their doors for me, at times when people are expecting me and my crew. And if you watch this show, you know we meet a lot of interesting people. People like this guy. The guy behind me keeps drinking my beers. He just keeps picking them up and drinking them. Like, they're his beers. And that guy. I would not like to meet you. There's going to be a lot of cops that are unhappy with you. Maybe you should move to Canada. This guy's interesting. Well, guess what? They're back. And I'll come face to face with them once again right here on American soil. Will they avenge me? What I'm gonna do is beat you in the rematch. <laughs> or will they just party with me? <laughs> Find out when I go three sheets to Manhattan. I'm now headed to the World Bar to drink worldly drinks. You see, do you see why we're starting at the World Bar? Because this is an international pub crawl. So we're starting at the World Bar, which is near the UN. You see what we did there? Okay. Located in the Trump Tower next to the UN, the World Bar is famous for a swanky high-priced beverage called the World Cocktail. It's funny when you're offered a drink that costs like 50 bucks, and I just prefer beer. You guys prefer beer? Oh well, as drinking ambassador to the world, beauty calls. Time to see why this drink is said to be worth its weight in gold. Hey, Ken. Zane, how are you? Nice to, nice to, to see finally you. see you again yeah. for the first time. Welcome to the World Bar. Thank you very much. Ken is the general manager here, and he's let me in before they open it's for a special one-on-one -on -one about the world cocktail. Yes. Whenever anybody comes to the World Bar and orders this cocktail, we bring this very tray mm -hmm. right to your table. This specific tray right here. This very specific tray right here. Ken starts with a shot of high-end cognac, 
Then he prepares ingredient number two. You know, the Chiron is sweet white wine, and it's been fortified with fine French cognac. OK. After a shot of that. What we have in here is freshly squeezed white grape juice. You do that on, on, on premises? On premises. On site? All fresh juices, yes. Okay. And that has been added to some uh, fresh squeezed lemon juice and Angostura bitters. Now Ken shakes it with ice. You smile when you shake it. Oh, absolutely. OK. Next, he fills the flute and tops it with a fine champagne. And the crowning touch of the world cocktail is the infamous 23 carat liquefied gold. Wow. Yes. And gold does have some very good medicinal qualities. So not only will you get gold lips, but you will uh, cure any fatigue you might have, aches and pain. Wait a minute. Did he say gold is good for me? Time to get out the Three Sheets Nutritional Handbook. Metallic gold, such as gold leaf, is biologically inert, which would suggest it has no effect on the body whatsoever. However, some sources claim that colloid gold, microparticles of gold suspended in liquid, may be effective in managing some forms of joint pain and even increase IQ scores. I don't know if it's good for me, but it did give me gold lips. Hey, that's not that's not bad. And now you too can come here and drink a world cocktail served from the very same tray that served me. Table. A specific tray right here. It's a very specific tray right here. So I fulfilled my duties as world drinking ambassador. That was quick. That's pretty good. I think it's time to move on. I'm not really a tux guy. I'm more of a jeans and a plebeius shirt. Plebeius t-shirt kind of a guy. More casual clothes, and onto a more casual bar. The one and only McSorley's. Established by John McSorley back in 1854, this pub has continuously remained in business longer than any other pub in Manhattan. So what would have been the uh, the cheers in Ireland? Schlante, something like Schlante. that? Schlante. Schlante, yeah. Close enough, there we close go. enough. To find out more about this Irish-American relic, meet Pepe, the not-so-Irish bartender. What makes it an Irish pub? M Mr. McSorley? Mr. McSorley, uh, most of the employees, I still don't know what I'm doing here. I must have done a good job working at a house. Pepe, the bartender, has worked here since 1973. Wow. I was the uh, house attendant. I would stand in front of the only bathroom we had. Okay. And I'd allow three men oh. to use the three urinals. Oh, and two women to use the two stalls. I had to keep the... Keep the flow of people going. A, and the flow of fluids oh. going. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a crappy job. You know what we should do? We should start off with a beer. How about an ale? Because we don't sell beer. Wow. You see what happened right there? He just yeah. jumped right into it. OK. Time for Pepe to set me straight. Um, and so this is a uh, an ale. McSorley cream ale. Though it's called a cream ale, it really doesn't taste creamy. More crisp with a good bite. Yummy. Hoppy. Now time for the dark. You just have two kinds of beers. Two kinds of ales. Damn it. Don't two kinds of ales. Like... You don't even serve any, you know, Irish beers. That's correct. It's all. Why sell somebody else's when we can sell our own? Both the dark and the light are around 6% alcohol, but the dark is actually sweeter and milder in flavor because caramel has been added. How does that grab you? It's nice. It's you know, this one actually has a stronger taste yes. than this one. I think so. That's preferred by the younger people that come in here. I'm a younger people. Pepe says these are the original recipes dating back to when this place was first established. And the fact that this place and its ales have survived as long as they have is no small accomplishment. We had this little thing called Prohibition in the States. Heard about that. That would be yeah, very yeah, bad yeah. for my show. McSorley survived Prohibition by doing two things. First, they began brewing a near beer with an extremely low alcohol content that met with government standards. And they served it to patrons in the front room. Second, they maintained a profitable under-the-table operation in the back room. A speakeasy, was it? For the most part, yeah. So you had to have a password to get back there? A uh, password or, you know. Or know, or know somebody? That helped. That helped. Tammany Hall was only seven blocks away, so we catered to the politicians. Hello. Long before Prohibition, McSorley's was the place to come to make the mother of all wishes. During the Great War, before the local guys would be shipped out, they'd have a turkey dinner in here and they'd save the wishbones. Wow. The young men that came home 
took their wishbones off that fixture. Oh, after, if, if they came back from war. If they, if they came back. Right. These gentlemen never made it home, so oh, we left it there to moment. commemorate them. The walls and decor tell many stories, but the best way to really understand this place is to talk to the regulars, especially this guy. I've never met a poet before. I'm Zane. Nice to meet you. What's your name? W.H. Jiggers Turner. Well, that's a poet's name right there. There you go. You had to be a poet with that name. Jiggers is an actor, stuntman, and poet. And on St. Patrick's Day back in 2003, right here at McSorley's, he penned this little ditty. McSorley's, I know you don't see me sometimes, but I fall down in you and look up to you like looking at the world, but falling down, bringing people together for now. Take me down a little farther and let me see. Look up at everyone, be the cat on the street. But I don't have to be homeless. I can stand up and see at McSorley's only you, the world, and me. It's heavy. Speaking of the world and me, other worldly destinations are calling me, so I'm out of here. So, are you ready? Coming up, a French tradition that includes sharp objects and exploding bottles. Shall I? I like, actually, I like to build up this, the suspense a little bit. Okay. In France, New Year's Eve is celebrated with a feast called La Réveillon de la saint Sylvestre, in honor of the Pope who built St. Peter's Basilica. These feasts often include champagne and foie gras. Right now, I'm heading to a French champagne house in Manhattan's Tribeca neighborhood called the Bubble Lounge, where I'll attempt a traditional and somewhat dangerous champagne drinking tradition. Don't try this at home. Don't, don't try to do what we are doing at home. So what are we doing? I'm here with Eric, and Eric is gonna show me how to open a bottle of champagne with a sword, a rapier, if you will, a implement of destruction. Eric is what they call a master saberer. He gives classes on how to open champagne with a sword right here on the premises. If you watch other episodes, you'll notice I carry a sword with me. Well, only in Croatia. <laughs> but with a machete in Puerto Rico and a pretty vicious fork in Mexico. <laughs> anyway, about sabering. You see, the art of opening champagne bottles with swords dates back to Napoleonic times when French military officers would do it in celebration of victory. If you wanted to do this at your house and you didn't have one of these sabers, you'd take a kitchen knife and you'd use the back side of the blade. You your... can do this with a kitchen knife? Like, like, a, like, a, like a big butcher? Yeah, sort of a heavy, sort of heavy knife. Okay, secondary disclaimer time. Look, people, this can be really dangerous. Seriously. We're talking about sharp objects, broken glass, and flying projectiles. So we at Three Sheets recommend you leave the saber rattling to the experts. So now we're gonna, you're gonna show me how to open this bottle. Right. So you're, what you're going to do is make sure that the bottle is very well chilled. Okay. The best thing to do is to put it uh, for a few minutes neck down in uh, uh, ice water. Okay. The reason you chill it neck down is first, because cooler champagne is less likely to foam out and wind up on the ground. And second, Cool glass is more brittle, making it easier to break. You really don't want to shake it. You don't want to have too much trauma to it, and you're going to undress it completely from the shoulder up. Wait, did you hear what he just said? You're going to undress it completely. Yeah, he said undress. <laughs> Time for a little strip tease. To properly undress a champagne bottle, you must first remove the aluminum gown. Then, place your thumb over the cork to prevent a premature burst, and remove the muzzle or cage, leaving behind a naked bottle anxious to release its precious nectar. At this point, you're holding the equivalent of a loaded weapon. So always do like I'm doing here and point it away from people because it can blow up at any time. Really. Yeah, baby! That's what I was saying. You don't even need it. You did it. Check that shit out. Yes, you saw it right here on three sheets. Undressed cool. champagne bottles do spontaneously open. Anyway, back to Eric's bottle. I've got the thumb up the rear. 
Okay. He holds the bottle like that so he doesn't catch any fingers with the sword. So you put the blade on the stitch. Okay. The stitch should be like the seam. The seam is the weakest point on the bottle created when the glass was fused together. Okay, I know. And I, I, it looks like to me like you're 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 gonna hit this little rim here. That's the annulus. Okay. And I'm gonna go, and this kind of a movement is gonna be just about that fast, and it's gonna be. I, I'm sorry. Are, are you, is the core coming? Is the, is the bottle breaking or no? Yeah, it's breaking right around the annulus right here. Notice the angle on the bottle. He keeps it tilted up slightly so champagne is not pressing against the cork. This reduces overflow after it's opened. So, are you ready? Shall I? Okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. You ready? Yeah. All right. There you have it. Nice clean cut. So, we're not worried about glass nope. shards? The, Why? The pressure in the bottle of champagne is equal to that of a truck tire. If there's any shards, they're not going in. I can vouch, no shards in the glass he pours for me. Nice. You see, you got a clear cut here, nice yeah. and clean. Clean and sharp. So oh. that is sharp. It is sharp, and then, yes. And then the other, the other thing is that the champagne balls are always going to be cold and wet by <laughs> nature. OK. So you put it back in the ice bucket, and when you pick it up, if you don't have a good grip, you will slide slides. and you, will cut, you might cut off your hand. OK, I've seen the master. So you want to do it? Yes. Remove the gown. It would be really embarrassing that if I cut myself in the tin foil. No. OK. It would make the show. Place thumb above cork when removing the muzzle. Because sometimes they misfire. Locate the seam. So it's right there. Bottle angled up slightly, hand underneath, thumb in the rear, and fire away. And it's not in the wrist. It's all in the elbow. So OK, so it's just this? Yep. And it's a uh, How quick? Through. How quick? Like that? Maybe a little bit quicker. Like that? Yep. There you go. Now, don't f with me. There you go. Don't f with me. No, no. Now, if you're a regular watcher of the show, you know that when I went to Champagne, France, I earned an honorary diploma from Champagne College. Well, here at the Bubble Lounge, Eric is doing me one better. With this diploma, Zane, yes. I knight you into the order of champagne sabers. With my newly earned bogus knighthood, I think my work here is done. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, I discover the origins of German hooch. It's basically German moonshine. Yes. Right? Yes. And remember this guy? Time for a rematch. Won't even be close. I'll guarantee that. You're pointing to the outfield right now. No doubt. In Berlin, Germans watch the clock strike 12 at the clock tower of the Rat House at Alexanderplatz in the city center. You can hear them shouting, Ein Glückiges Neues Jahr, which means Happy New Year. Right now, I'm headed to the German bar in Manhattan's West Village called Lederhosen, or Leather Pants. Are you Dirk? Yes, I'm Dirk. You're magnificent. Look at the size of you. Hey, nice I was coming in. You. I was going to come in here and, and wrestle you, but I'm not going to anymore. Dirk is the German-born owner of this place. Welcome to Lederhosen. Thank you. Is Jim the cop back there? Yes, he is. In case you've forgotten, I beat Jim the cop in a chugging contest in Puerto Rico. Exactly the order is going to happen. I would not like to beat you. There's going to be a lot of cops that are unhappy with you. Maybe you should move to Canada. Well, this New York native is out for vindication. He emailed Mojo and said he wanted basically a rematch. Yes, I just want a rematch of the chugging contest, and I think this time I'm going to beat you. Really? I'm almost confident. It won't even be close. I'll guarantee that. I will guarantee okay. it on your show. I will guarantee you. You guarantee me. <laughs> wow. You threw down the gauntlet. Let's go. Now we're going to throw down our gauntlets. This is your job, but I think I could do no, it. No, my job is not, not to pound the beers. My job is to enjoy them. I've, I've watched the celebrate. show, and you you pound beers. I save not people, for you pound beers. Yeah, that's pretty. You, you save lives? I save lives and deliver babies. Excuse me? Hi. Could you guys 
we're gonna um, do a chugging contest. Could you, what do you just say on your mark, get set, go, whatever. Ready? Yeah. Ein, Schwein, go. One time, down two times, every time. Man, come on, come on. Here we go, here we go, come on, come on. Better get up on the floor. Better get up on the floor. Wow. That was really cold. I'm gonna go back to tape. Can we see? So I did start after you, but you put your, your glass down slowly and I slammed it down. I think it, I think it was really, it, it was, was close. Close enough for an official review. Jim the cop is quick out of the gates with an early start. But then he falters, spilling a substantial amount. Major foul. Jim the cop does appear to empty his mug slightly ahead of Lamprey. But then in a swift move, Lamprey gets his mug down to the table faster. Table to table, Lamprey wins. And Lamprey scores no spilling fouls. So the judges award Lamprey with a technical victory. A technical victory? Nobody likes to win on a technicality. So I think Jim deserves an honor of his own for a well-fought battle. So from this day forward, whenever someone spills beer on themselves while chugging, it will be said that they... Jim the Cop! And with the beers down our gullets, the water under the bridge, I think it's time to enjoy later hosing. And no better person to do it with than Dirk, the owner. To roast to each other. Okay, fine. For help. For help. Or this. Drink beer for help. On the going on the, on the table is to salute to the place you're in. I salute your place. Yes. There we go. <laughs> yes, Dirk serves German beer and Oktoberfest style mugs. But his bar is also a collection of other more potent German beverages, including this one called First Bismarck. It's basically. German moonshine. Yes. Right? Yes. It was, it was com it's a commercialized version of the it was, moonshine. It's a commercialized version. It's grain alcohol made from corn, much like American moonshine. They used to have um, anywhere from 140 to 100 and proof? 60 proof. Dirk says that back in the day, German mining companies used to ration rot gut out to workers. It was made for miners uh, to, you know, they got every week they got a bottle. To, Supposingly kept the dust of the lungs, the coal dust. The old high octane corn based hooch has since been outlawed, but it did inspire the creation of a more refined, appreciated, and commercialized 80 proof corn based spirit, which we have here. <laughs> After sipping, there is a discrepancy in the flavor. It's a piece of bread, right? A piece of bread? No, bread, uh, bre you know, rye bread? Yeah. No, it doesn't taste like rye bread. It tastes like alcohol. It tastes like alcohol. Exactly. It's rubbing same. alcohol. I Rubbing think. alcohol? Rubbing alcohol, that's exactly what it tastes like. I think it has a bready taste, of, like uh, rye bread. Speaking of rye bread, oh, you know I could use something to eat to soak up all the booze from this day-long drinking excursion. So I'm off to Satsuko. At first glance, it seems like a Japanese restaurant and sake bar. But get a closer look, and you'll find something that's more New York than anything else. Ricardo, the manager, is from Chile. Diego, the cook, is from Uruguay. Reggae music is always blaring, and the foods are a blend of influences. And Ricardo knows I need food right now. This is tuna tartar. Yeah, which and means... this is a uh, wasabi mayo, the thing on top. Mmm. Whoa. That? Nice, right? That's nice. The tartar is just the beginning. As it's tilapia. Oh, look at that. That's tilapia with hummus, and this is masago jalapeno. Some of the foods reflect Latin American influences. This is spicy. But there's also an unmistakable Japanese influence. When you're doing a pub crawl, international or otherwise, you should always stop and eat. Fill your belly because if you're just drinking, you're gonna get crazy, you're gonna get crazy looping. And now that Ricardo has stuffed me to the gills, he introduces me to a tradition here at Satsuko. I'll show you how we do these here. Remember in South Korea when we learned how to do a soju bombing raid? Oh, look at this. I feel like this is gonna end up on my lap. Three, two, one, zero. 
Well, here at Satsuko, they have a signature sake bomb. And all you need is a big mug of beer, some chopsticks, and of course, sake. So basically, we're gonna count one, two, three. Yeah. We're gonna bang the bar. Yeah. The shit is gonna drop in there, and then we're gonna chug it. Okay. Yes. One, two, three. Okay, you can't win them all. Especially after eating an endless supply of food. Uh, you know what? How was that? I was afraid. I almost, I almost gymmed the cops on my, on my shirt. <laughs> okay. So if you got a little stuff in your stuff, you'd be like, ah, you gymmed the cop on that. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> he's notorious for doing that kind of crap. Not only does Ricardo serve up sake bombs, he serves up a vast amount of knowledge about the wide variety of sakes they have on the menu. The way I learn here about sake is basically drinking. I've been working for three years in this place. Do you speak Japanese? No, or but, just I, food? but my trick is that I, I pronounce Japanese as Spanish. So even Japanese people think that I speak Japanese, Japanese because I put, the balls are the same. I, I, oh, you see what he's doing? Give me an example. Uh, this one sounds good, Kiku Masamunetaru. So you do it like, like, in, like with a Spanish yeah, cadence. Yeah, that's my trick, yeah. That's a good trick. Yeah. Even now, though, even now they know it, yeah. use it. But that's not the only Japanese-Spanish hybrid around here. Kampud. Kampud. What's yeah. that mean? Kampai salud. Okay, so kampai is cheers in Japanese. Kampai. 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 Bye bye. Salud is cheers in Spanish. Salud. Salud. Yes. Salud. Salud. Put them together, and there you have it. Did you just make that up? Yeah. You heard it here first. The official Satsuko toast, as determined by Ricardo, right here on Three Sheets. <laughs> In honor of our new toast, Ricardo breaks out the fancy stuff. It's called Bunraco Kinmai. <laughs> he says with a Spanish accent. That's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> ah, what the heck? I had liquid gold earlier. Now it's time for the gold leaf. It looks like a snow, like a snow globe yeah. with booze and gold. Ricardo tells me that this is a popular ceremonial drink in Japan, kind of like champagne at weddings. Kamput, kamput. We didn't, we didn't make this the clinky sound. Kamput, kamput. Get it? I feel good. Good enough for a reunion with an old friend. Coming up, the beer hunter is back. Wow. Did you expect that it would be just like it was in Belgium? On New Year's Eve in Belgium, families throw a réveillon, a party where everyone kisses, exchanges good luck greetings, and drinks toasts to absent relatives and friends. Right now, I'm on my way to bar number six of my international pub crawl through Manhattan. It's the one and only Burp Castle. Around here, they take drinking beer very seriously. We're at Burp Castle, and this place is a, a, a Belgian-themed bar. Yeah, Belgian. And what happens is, it's, it's an interesting thing that happens when you get loud at Burp Castle. They shush you. They shush you, and why? So we can have conversations. See, it's very sort of monastic. Oh. Monastic, like, as in the monks. It gets loud, oh, you shush, you have some breathing word. exercises. It's, it's like yoga, but with beer. The monks on the wall and the monastic tone make sense. Remember when we met that beer-making monk in Belgium? Well, here at the Burp Castle, the beer is treated with equal reverence. Whether you're talking about the artisanal American brews or the high-end Belgian imports. We have the beer, we have the, the atmosphere of, of Belgium, but we're missing something from the Belgian episode, and I think you know who it is. Come here, Logan. You remember this guy? Look who it is, everybody. It's the beer hunter. Remember meeting Logan in Belgium? The guy behind me keeps drinking my beers. He just picks them because oh, that's good. Well, 
I've done some research on Logan in the blogosphere and found out that he really is a respected beer critic. I regularly run into Three Sheets fans. Well, and what's the general consensus? They say, dude, you're great, dude. You are great, Logan. Yeah. So. What else? Uh, they said, dude, you need to host a show, dude. <laughs> you, uh, you, uh, you know what? Take it away. Go for yeah. it. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the exclusive Three Sheets premiere of Logan's Beer Run. On this episode of Logan's Beer Run, we learn proper Belgian beer drinking etiquette. Shall we get a glass? No, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong. No, that's just so wrong. I like it as What did I tell you about the aroma? The olfactory is an important part of the beer drinking. Belgian beer makers actually offer customized glasses designed to maximize the marriage between aroma and flavor. You smell that aroma, you want to do that when you first pour it. Smell the aroma, and then when you taste it, taste it on your tongue, and then taste it all the way through, and taste it all the way to the finish. Beautiful. Logan, you saw the episode. Yes. You know you have to go like this when you burp. The last person to do that has to drink. It's a rule on the show. Yeah! Loser. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I wasn't what's... aware of this custom. <laughs> I don't know, dude. It's called the Burp Castle. The guy we're putting through the ringer is Jerry. He doesn't work here, he works at a cheese shop. And as he often does when he comes here to the Burp Castle, he's brought a platter of meats and cheeses to complement the beer drinking experience. Yeah, I mean, anything anything that's like slightly salty, as almost all cheeses are, yes. will be a good counterpoint to like a, a kind of a light sweet beer, sweeter beer, like the Duvel, or like a lot of the Belgian ones. Mm -hmm. The Belgian Duvel is served in the proper glass, of course. It's hoppy, yet light, and slightly sweet and fruity. So this is a very salty cheese. This is sort mm -hmm. of a very smoky, earthy cheese. Goes well with this beer mm -hmm. because it's because it's, it's fruity mm -hmm. and light and crisp and refreshing. Up next, they pour me a Captain Lawrence smoked porter, brewed right here in New York. What's the, difference, what's the difference, difference between a porter and a stout, Logan? A porter, it tends to be not wow. as rich and uh, dark and dark roasted malt. Uh, might have a little bit more sweetness. I would say the smoked porter would be really good with like a, a blue cheese. Like something that's really strong. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This flavor is so strong. Yeah. This beer is so strong. I feel like they sort of work to counteract each other. That really. Um, it's just my opinion. Yeah. Well, Jerry says the pairing of beer with cheese is really a matter of personal taste. Another matter of personal taste: Logan the beer hunter's customized business cards. Gone to pee. Leave my beer alone. And then on the back, it has his name and his contact information in case maybe you find a beer of his someplace you can let him know where it is. I can tell you this, with all the beer that flows here, a beer claim ticket might not be a bad idea. Lovely. I'm so happy to have you back, Logan. <laughs> hey, I... <laughs> Though it's been fun, I must be moving on. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Are you pleased to hear and enjoy? Sante. Sante. Cheers. Hi. Auf Wiedersehen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tight. Bless you. And I need security. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. It's time for a more Eastern Bloc feel. So my driver cruises me over to the Russian vodka room. Oh my God, what happened? It's Tim the f***ing bar guy. We're gonna go and we're gonna have vodka in the Russian vodka room. It's infused. Come on, let's go infuse ourselves in some vodka. We're gonna infuse ourselves in some vodka. Tim's among a cast of characters who frequent this bar, where giant jugs of infused vodka sit atop the large wine cabinet just to the right of the entrance. But there's more to this place than just infused vodkas. So, quick question, basic question. So, why do you, why do you guys come here? The best you can get in of Russia in the U.S. is this place here. Okay, it's my favorite joint town. I come here for for the girls. I come here for the vodka. And I come here for the Baltica beer, the Russian beer. Okay, are you ready? And for Slava. Slava is the owner. <laughs> oh, <you> see, <laughs> he came here from Russia about ten years ago. Is infused vodka traditional to Russia? Yeah. More or less, yes. Yeah, fairly common. Slava is going to tell me more about the infused vodkas, but there's also an interesting beer selection that harkens back to the old country. Yeah, I mean, Thomas, a regular here, has the details. So these are both Russian beers? Oh, in a sense, yeah, very much. 
Like Radeberg is from Dresden. Okay. Dresden used to be former GDR, East Germany. Okay. You know, so under the influence of the Russian uh, Soviet Union Empire. And, and what about this one? Czech? Czechoslovakia. So I think it, 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 so it, it so falls with under crater influence area of Russia. So these were both at one point part of Russia when it was at its biggest. And that's the okay, to yeah. that. Well, you know, we're in a Russian bar, so. Okay, enough politics and beer. Here we go. All right. Let's get to the infused vodka. Horseradish and vodka? Horseradish with vodka. Ugh, smell it. So what do we say, das Vananya? And do we kill it? Or am I... Nasdorovia. Nasdorovia. Be healthy. What did I say? Das Vananya, I said goodbye. Goodbye, yeah. <laughs> See ya. While I commit the proper toast to memory, some classic Russian drinking snacks are brought out, and Slava wants me to dive into the pickled herring. So, uh, here we go. This is part of the same, okay. Yeah, that's a tradition. Nasdorovia. Nasdorovia. It tastes like the horseradish you put on roast beef, and then you're eating this rich piece of meat. Fish, yes, fish, yeah, fish, fish okay, meat. yeah. such a thing. And so it, it's more of a meal than it is a drink. It's not sweet at all. It's, it's good. After the herring and horseradish, Slava pulls out another, shall we say, memorable flavor. Have garlic. Garlic. Garlic infused vodka. Right now I'm thinking it's a good thing I brought breath mints. Yeah? What the mother? <laughs> Slava says you can take the edge of a pungent drink like this by sniffing on Russian black bread. Bread schmed. How do I get the good stuff? What can I say or do to make it so that we eat the caviar quickly? Caviar requires some pure stuff. Okay. I would stay away from infusion. Slava recommends a vodka called Zir. Very, very mild, nice, um, um, grainy flavor. And you keep it, you keep it in the freezer. Nice. Okay, why, of course. You want your woman hot and your vodka, your vodka cold. Before drinking, we prepare our opulent food chasers, bellinis, which are like little Russian pancakes eaten with caviar and other toppings. No, it's not over. No, it's not over. You don't have to drink the whole one. What do you think? I think at I this pace, it. I'm going to be hammered in about 17 minutes. Woo! You know how difficult it is to do a, a pub crawl in New York, an international pub crawl in New York while pacing yourself? With that in mind, maybe it's time to spread the love. What, are you going to kill it? I think you should... Yes! Oh, yeah! Nasterovia! While these guys polish off the free vials of vodka, I make a break for it. Oh, wow, this bread smells good. Mm, that's good bread, you guys. Coming up, a south of the border bar, where I meet up with a fellow mojo man. And we duke it out for HD supremacy. When you turn on your television, Maybe you prefer things in the high definition format, which is from the future. No one understands hey, it. What? King of Miami. Oh. On New Year's Eve in Mexico, people will often eat 12 grapes as the clock strikes midnight and make a wish for the coming year with each grape. Right now, I'm headed to Under the Volcano, a Manhattan bar that features fine tequila and mezcal. But that's not all that's here, because tonight, I'm meeting with the king. I'm Zane. I'm Allison. Allison, nice to meet you. This is Dave Hill, king of Miami. Well, hello there. I'm sure you know that. That's right, people. Dave Hill is in the house. Same man playing. What? What's the best tequila? Let me, you know, it's an interesting question. The best tequila is the one you like the best, Dave. Oh, it's like a, a singular journey. It's like you against the course. No, it's not. So it's just like golf. It's, no, it's not quite. It's not quite that. Intense. Or it's like it's not the size of the board. It's the motion of the ocean. Or, or it's like uh, snowflakes, and everyone's different. Right. Actually, not. It's not like that. We already learned all about tequila when I went to Mexico. I've pulled out a white tequila, which is not aged. Okay. Oh wait, we got. Oh. So you, you nice. know, um... This is a reposado tequila aged in oak barrels for two months to a year. Is, is tequila regulated by the government in Mexico? Yes. And this is Anejo, 
tequila aged for one to three years. But tequila facts aren't in question here. The question tonight, is this bar big enough to handle two powerhouse celebrities? Mine shows the biggest show on the network. This must be exciting for you. It's called King of Miami. It's right. like the big show on the network. It's like the flagship show. So where where did you go in your in your show? Just one Miami. Oh, one city. Oh wow. I went to like probably 30 or 40 countries. But I'm sure Miami's I, nice. You command a lot of respect. I've been in the industry for weeks. Me and Reese Witherspoon and Michael Douglas. The three captains of industry. You know what you should do? You should host an actual episode of Three Sheets with me. Not just, not just a little bar scene. But that's what I suggested. To who? They said they wouldn't pay for the plane ticket. Oh, yeah, you have to pay for your own plane ticket. All right. You're ready for it. After a lot of banter and many tequila samples. I'm wild for this tequila stuff. It's really catching on. Yeah. The King and I discover we have something in common. It's like they don't pay us enough to afford a TV to watch our shows on. That's the irony, the great irony. It is the great all. irony of it. Now that we've bonded over our shared fame and low pay, oh, okay. I think it's time for a little surprise. Oh, is this an intervention? Is that what no, this no, is? No, no, no. Is that a surprise? Oh, not on our show. The surprise here is cheap mezcal with a worm in it. Christina, Mike said we'd be remiss if we did not bring you into the show because you drank a lot of stuff. Here's clips of Christina drinking stuff. Awesome. Just finish it. <laughs> One, two, three, kill it. Yeah, there's a worm in your mouth, there's a worm, there's a worm! He's squiggling. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Alice and the bartender can't stand to see me force my friends to drink the cheap stuff. I would say that your mass-produced mezcal yeah. uh, that is using the worm as a gimmick or a scorpion as a gimmick right. is, you know, to get the little gringo frat boy to buy the bottle and drink to the bottom. Right. Thinking they're going to get high off But them. you don't. No. Allison points out that high-quality mezcal without the worm is worth enjoying. So what's the difference between mezcal and tequila? First, mezcal is made from agave not just blue agave like tequila. Second, remember when we were in Mexico? We saw tequila makers roasting the blue agave. Well, with mezcal, the agave is smoked in deep underground pits, giving it a more smoky flavor. flavor. I like that smoky flavor. Well, let me actually say. give you some good stuff. Here, at Under the Volcano, they serve the good mezcal in shallow uh, clay cups cheers. to enhance the earthy taste of the drink. Oh, that's, that's nice. Oh, that's smoky. Oh, yeah, I can really taste it. I think it's great that they're taking a chance Hold on one second. On stuff that's maybe not. Hold on one second. There yet. I think Steve. it's great. Like they're always. Hold on. Steve McKenna's calling me. Yeah. Me Steve, are you are you coming here? Yeah. It's Steve McKenna from Fish Eats Fame. And on that note, I'll leave the King of Miami to rain over under the volcano. I gotta meet Steve. Coming up. Drinking games with my drinking buddy. Historical records suggest that some 4,000 years ago, in ancient Babylon, New Year's celebrations began with the first new moon and often lasted for 11 days. Now that's a party. Right now, I'm in Manhattan on my way to the final stop on my international pub crawl, a slice of Americana at the Whiskey River with my favorite American drinking buddy, Steve McKenna. Remember the last time I drank with Steve in Kentucky? You might remember him with short hair, but I bring you Steve the Mophead McKenna, right here, man. <laughs> As a New York native, Steve assures me that if you want to meet a killer cast of New York characters, this is the place to do it. And the most common drinking pastime in these parts, beer pong. They have leagues here, and the teams take it very, very seriously. Lucky for us, the leagues have let Steve and I stake a claim at one end of the table. And we have acquired a regular here as our coach. Explain the rules, Joe. Basically, the rules are... Basically? Everybody goes twice. Anybody? You go twice, they go twice. You go twice, they go twice. 
Who are they? They are the Three Sheets production team members, Mike and Christina. Their coach, Calvin. So if you've been drinking beer in a cave all your life and you don't know this game, here's what's up. The teams start with 10 cups set up in pyramids. You don't have enough beer in your cup. It's a, it's a cool picture for a game. Let's fill the cups up and do it right. When the ball goes in, beer goes down. Shoot the middle of the Visualize. Visualize. If a team makes two in a row, they go again. Put it down, big man! Big fella! Eye of the tiger. He's trying to give me the eye of the tiger. I think now is a good time to take note of Steve McKenna's no-spill approach to chugging beer. He squeezes the cup to form a narrow funnel at the rim. This prevents the dreaded Jim the Cop. You see what I'm talking about? Is it? Is it? Is it? You see it? As for Coach Calvin's technique, eh, what's a little spilled beer amongst friends? When you get down to six, you reconfigure into a new pyramid. Then when you get down to three, you reconfigure again. Our game is down to the two final cups. We got it! We got it! We got it! We got it. Let's go, team! Let's go, team! I'm gonna get this in no matter what. Next. What's next? I'll tell you what's next. A pillow. I've been to nine bars. I've played with sharp objects. There you go. I've eaten well. And I've reunited with faces from my past. I'm so happy to have you back, Logan. Hey, I. I've had an international experience. Close. There we go. Met unforgettable people. W.H. Jigger's turn. Well, that's a poet's name right there. And best of all, reveled in victory alongside my buddy Steve. Well, at least we won, dude. Oops, careful, Stevie. Did you have fun? Let me call a cab for you or something? Yeah. Okay. All right, ma'am, be good. You want me to right, call a cab for you, buddy? All right. Happy New Year's. Please drink responsibly. And if you can't do that, eat responsibly. All right, here we go. See, this is why you don't get Steve McKennett, because if you do get Steve, Steve McKennett, see, this is where he chose to sleep, here. And this is the bed. But this is as far as he made it. Do you know someone like that? Is that you? OK, thanks for watching. Happy New Year's. Oh, 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 oh,